Hello, CH is true, and this is the beginning either of the end of the channel, if I'm unable to continue it, or the beginning of the next phase of the channel, which is a return to set theory, math, metaphysics, um, particularly non-computational math, like in the very beginning. But that is if I continue the channel. So if I'm not able to continue the channel, I want right now to dedicate it, the entire channel, all I think it's going on about six years now that, that I've been doing this channel. So I want to dedicate it to Jason and to his memory. Jason was a, an unknown giant in philosophy, unknown because his life was cut tragically short. Um, he was a friend of this channel. He was my friend, uh, someone who could do logic with the back of his hand in the dark uh, on top of Mount Everest, and, and it would still come out as a beautiful work of art. His sad passing is noted, and it's in his memory that I will dedicate this entire channel to his memory. So this is dedicated in his memory. And now let me do what might very, could very well be uh, the last video on this channel. Um, I want to discuss Ernst Mach, I want to discuss relativity, and I want to discuss why on earth I am discussing Ernst Mach and relativity. Especially since we don't talk about Ernst Mach anymore. We don't talk about the idea of Machian relativism. Ernst Mach was relevant after 1905 with special relativity and the idea that all is relative. In fact, Ernst Mach really, uh, his, his idea of relativism in the capital R sense. Relativism in the sense that there is no privileged frame of reference and that there is no real way we can talk about space and time other than through um, the measurement of it from a given reference frame. That is something that went out the window more or less in 1915 with Einstein's theory of general relativity and the idea that there is in fact a philosophy of space-time, that there is something we can call space and time, that we can talk about the Sun being the center of our solar system as opposed to um, not being able to tell if the Earth goes around the Sun or the Sun goes around the Earth, like with Ernst Mach and like with the 1905 version of relativity. By 1915, mountains were mountains and rivers were rivers again. We could talk about the idea of space, a philosophy of space-time, i.e. curved space-time, more massive objects curve space-time more, hence we can talk about gravity again. But I'm wondering if in the mad rush to throw out Ernst Mach, maybe the baby was thrown out with the bathwater. Was there something in Machian philosophy that it could be relevant? Not that we want to go back to uh, the early 20th century or, or late 19th century question of um, do, does space-time really exist? We don't want to go back to that because we don't want to go back to it in a scientific sense, but I think it's worthy of maybe asking some of those questions in a philosophical sense. Because when philosophers, when artists, when writers began asking the question based on a half-understood version of Einstein's relativity. It wasn't, again, the fully developed 1915 relativity, but it was a certain kind of takeoff on Einstein's relativity. That's when we had a flowering of literature. We had a flowering of the arts. We had a flowering of modern art, of, oh, here we go. Okay, I know a lot of people are going to hate this, but postmodernism. And I know everybody, it's fashionable to, to hate postmodernism, but I don't really understand why. I think it has ideas that are of value. I wouldn't go along with Heidegger. I wouldn't go along with a bunch of Nazis masquerading as being great philosophers. But that doesn't mean you can throw everything out just because somebody you may not like very much said something. I think that the idea of questioning whether we have an absolute frame of reference to determine reality is a good one. Now, with Einstein, he was not a relativist in that sense. He would say, yes, that light is an absolute. And he would say that there is something called space and time. But the questions asked about invariance, you know, Neuther's theorem and, and uh, uh, Ernst Mach's philosophy and some of the artistic styles that emerged in the 20s after World War I, some of the philosophies 
uh, existentialism. I think we would be a lot poorer as a culture without people at least willing to be daring. It's not the fashion of today to be daring. Today the fashion is to be politically correct, and we have political correctness of the right, and we certainly have political correctness of the left. Um, the political correctness of the right is more or less what runs the policies of Wall Street and what runs the the, um, the social and political policies, but a lot of, pardon me, the economic and political policies. And then the political correctness of the left is, defines what we can or can't talk about uh, on, on college campuses. But in both cases, you have a much poorer intellectual culture than what we had a hundred years ago in 1915 and 1916. And I think that, um, you know, we're a lot poorer for it. Uh, Ernst Mach asked the question of can we know ourselves but in relationship to the rest of the universe? If we were the only object in the universe, in what sense would we talk about motion? Or what sense would we talk about orientation or position? And I think that that's a question that people were afraid to ask, particularly cultural conservatives. If you throw out, it's, it's bad enough that Einstein threw out Euclid, because you know, you know, you, you, you don't have the absolute frame of reference that Newton had, but if people outside of science start throwing out ancient certainties, then are you just going to have one great Bauhaus of, of people running around uh, thinking, throwing out all kinds of, um, of, of staples that had been in human culture for thousands of years. In particular, religious people felt very threatened that suddenly um, monotheism and suddenly religion would be thrown out. But there's something very powerful in the history of Western thought, which is the, the idea of, of skepticism. And by skepticism, I'm not referring to skepticism in the 19th or 20th or 21st century sense, but in the Renaissance sense where skepticism and religious faith could actually go together very well. By skepticism, one would be questioning the idea of a complete model. And, and, and we have echoes of that in Gertel's Incompleteness. But in, in, in the um, 1600s and in the 1500s, people began the idea of questioning the idea of absolute reason. And the religious philosophers were, were gung-ho. They were all for it. They were glad to be called skeptics. Those were different times. They were also glad to be called humanists, interestingly enough. And in my own religious tradition, in the Judaic tradition, there's also the idea of iconoclasm, that the only absolute is God. And therefore, any other absolute, even if it's a cultural reference point, is subject to question. Uh, now, the very orthodox would, of course, say that the Torah is, you know, not subject to question. I'm, you know, my own, my own background is more of the kind of liberal Ashkenazic tradition. So, in the liberal Ashkenazic tradition, we were very much in the forefront of question of the the intellectual climate around Ernst Mach, around existentialism, and all these things. And yes, most of the people involved were atheists, but if you really look at it, they're they're um, the way that they approached claims of absolute certainty, their willingness to question absolute certainty could fit with an atheist worldview, but it could also fit with that tendency in monotheism that one would, would ascribe to um, iconoclasm. If the only absolute is God, then in what sense are you going to take something from human culture and elevate it to some kind of absolute? Sadly, today, we have in the religious sphere fundamentalism, and we have in the um, secular sphere it, its own fundamentalisms, and so people are less willing to go out on a limb and embrace ideas like postmodernism or uh, e even the flowering of human creative thought of the 60s, even in the 80s, even the intellectual freedom of the 80s, we don't see as much. But if I'm going to continue this channel, that's the direction I'm heading. As iconoclastic as I was, I'm going to be more iconoclastic and daring in the future. If I don't continue this channel, let this video at least be some kind of step for you to do it in your direction.